how does this turn into this? Or how does this become this? Or this turn into this? All of these leaps and many more actually have one thing in common. Well, really one place in common. And you're looking at it. Since it was founded 70 years ago, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has been at the forefront of science and technology innovation, producing research that has changed the world in ways you've probably never heard of, but that you're probably holding in the palm of your hand right now. Your electronic device starts with a chip. These channel electricity through transistors, which act as little gates, turning electric current on or off in specific patterns, on the most fundamental level, that's what lets your tech do stuff like this. But as phones and other electronic devices have gotten both smaller and more powerful, we've had to fit even more transistors on even smaller chips. We can do that because of extreme ultraviolet lithography. EUVL means using lasers to produce extreme ultraviolet light that etches transistors into a silicon chip. LNL, along with two other national labs, developed some of the original tools and techniques that have made EUVL what it is today, which is what allows there to be powerful microchips inside pretty much every device in your life. EUVL is what's made it possible for 10 billion transistors to fit on a chip the size of a fingernail, meaning your phone can do this instead of just this. Speaking of lasers, LNL has also been instrumental in birthing entire new eras of astronomy. The lab developed a mirror with small movable segments for use in telescopes. Pair this with a laser beam and you've got yourself a laser guide star. This seemingly simple tool takes the twinkle out of starlight. It sounds like something from Star Trek, but it's a real thing that solves a real problem. See, when astronomers look at the night sky, they have to look through layers of Earth's atmosphere, and that causes distortion. But this LNL-developed laser guide star technology made outer space more clearly visible from Earth than ever before. And it's widely used today in observatories all around the world. We have this advancement to thank for images of continents made of ice on the moon Titan, infrared photos of storms on Jupiter, and photos of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Out-of-this-world discoveries aren't just confined to the realms of outer space. In the 1970s, lab researchers refined a tool that has changed biological science forever. It's called flow cytometry. It's a technique that allows scientists to rapidly and accurately sort, count, and image microscopic structures like cells, and even the chromosomes that carry our genetic information. This is a typical kind of picture that we may get on the machine when we're running. And what we're seeing here are the chromosomes uh, that exist in a, in a, for a typical human being. The advancements in flow cytometry made at LLNL were necessary to launch the Human Genome Project, which gave us the first ever map of all of the genes that make humans human. Flow cytometry is an essential part of many different fields today. It's used in cancer biology, fertility testing, diagnosing diseases, understanding the immune system, marine biology, plant biology, microbiology, pharmaceutical testing, and so much more. But when it comes to things that are even smaller than your chromosomes, how do we know how things like atoms move? The field of science dedicated to understanding how atomic level structures behave is called molecular dynamics, and it was born at LNL. It combines really powerful computers and really cool math. Lab scientist Bernie Alder created this field when he first used LNL's computers to understand molecular movement. That's because everything around us, all the matter in the world, is made up of atoms. So predicting how these vast quantities of particles will move and affect one another with their movement is impossible to predict by hand. You need a lot of computing power to do it. Fortunately, LNL has always had some of the fastest and most powerful computers in the world from its founding in 1952 up till now. These computational methods have evolved throughout the past 70 years and still help us understand some of the trickiest problems today in material science, physics, chemistry, and more. 
And speaking of modeling, did you know that behind your car's modern safety features is just one 5,000 line piece of code? That code is called Dyna 3 d and it was written by lab scientist John Halquist to model extreme impacts. John realized just how important this could be to so many fields, so he made it open source. That means freely available to read and adapt by any member of the public. And now it's used by companies all over the world to simulate everything from aerosol behaviors to battery cooling to aerodynamics, and maybe most commonly to simulate vehicle crashes to test their design and safety without ever having to actually crash the car. It's been used to test the design of seatbelts, airbags, and many other safety improvements that helped your car go from this to this. But if any change has been most notable and important in the past 70 years of science, it's our evolving understanding of our climate. In 1989, the lab founded the Program for Climate Model Diagnosis and Intercomparison, or the PCMDI. Since its birth, it has been one of the world's most powerful programs for comparing, evaluating, and improving climate models to help us understand what's going on and why. In fact, in an early report for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, PCMDI scientist Ben Santer was the lead author of a hallmark section that stated, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. This was one of the first explicit statements of humanity's linkage to the climate crisis. Lab scientists have been leading contributors to every IPCC climate report since, improving computer models and conducting key studies with collaborators, and providing modeling and analysis tools for all to use. Because the lab is dedicated to using its broad expertise to look forward and find solutions. Scientists at the National Ignition Facility, for example, are working towards fusion ignition, that's the point at which we get more energy out of a nuclear fusion reaction than we put into it. Nuclear fusion could be the future of clean energy. And in 2021, the NIF achieved a record-breaking 1.3 megajoules of energy output from a fusion experiment, putting researchers at the threshold of fusion ignition. Future experiments will help us learn more about nuclear fusion and high energy physics, and perhaps unlock the possibility of fusion energy. And that's just seven of the ways that lab science has changed the world so far. The most exciting part is that the lab is still going strong. With the most recent advancements showing us the promise of the lab's current efforts, who knows what the next 10 years will give us? What discoveries, inventions, and what progress will come next? If you want more info like this, you can check out the lab's timeline website to explore many more of the amazing science and tech projects that have come out of the lab during its past 70 years. And if you have questions or want us to cover another achievement from the lab's past, present, or future, let us know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching.